Welcome to Michael Myers Minute, where we delve into the 1978 horror classic Halloween one minute at a time. I'm your host, Robert Black. We start this minute fading out from the crane shot from minute seven. Before we really get into minute eight, let's insert the first scene for television. These scenes were filmed when Halloween 2 was in production to pad the runtime of the first film for TV airings. Uh, here we get two scenes in a row for a total of about 4 minutes, 40 seconds, I think. The first one, the title card, were Smith's Grove, Illinois, and title card, May 1st, 1964. In a large auditorium, Loomis talks to two court psychiatrists, or rather two court psychiatrists talk to Loomis. It's a large room, lots of seats, but... They are the only three people. The older psychiatrist says, Reading from decision of Judge Walter Ward, I have no choice but to remand Michael Audrey Myers to the Smiths Grove Warren County Sanitarium, where he shall be placed in the care of a resident psychiatrist. We shall report to this court no less than twice a year. Camera angles on Loomis from behind the psychiatrist. He puts his hands by his face. He sits in seat 37. If you like details, like that. The old psychiatrist continues further. Michael Audrey Myers shall be brought before the court on the day of his 21st birthday. Angle from behind Loomis. Dialogue continues, where he shall be tried as an adult for the murder of his sister, Judith Margaret Myers. Loomis stands up. Dr. Loomis. Michael Myers must be removed from the sanitarium immediately, he says. I would suggest a maximum security ward at Litchby. Now the younger psychiatrist speaks up. Dr. Loomis, the decision has been made. Loomis but this is a minimum security institution. The staff isn't adequately prepared. The older psychiatrist. Prepared for what? The boy is catatonic. He exhibits comatose behavior. No reaction to external stimuli. Loomis. Have you read my notes? Older psychiatrist. Yes, we have, doctor. Loomis. Why were they not presented at the hearing? Younger psychiatrist. The judge requested Dr. Foster's analysis. Loomis. He says this rather angrily. (laughs) I've spent four hours a day. Four hours a day with this boy, every day, for six months. Far longer than any court psychiatrist. Older psychiatrist, Dr. Loomis. Loomis, Michael Myers is the most dangerous patient I have ever observed. Younger psychiatrist, doctor, there is no diagnostic evidence to support that statement. Loomis, he's he's covering up. This catatonia is a conscious act. There's instinctive force within him. He is waiting. Younger psychiatrist, for what? Loomis, I don't know. There's a long pause. They cut back and forth between the psychiatrist and Loomis, like a standoff. Finally, the older psychiatrist speaks again. We can make a special recommendation to the court only if we feel there is a justifiable reason to change the patient's treatment. I can see no reason why he shouldn't remain here. We have adequate facilities for his care. Loomis, there's insufficient security here. Please, I am begging you to reconsider your decision. Younger psychiatrist. Dr. Loomis, perhaps you should reconsider keeping him as your patient. We can find someone else to look after him. Loomis. And without pausing here, Loomis says, I'll stay with him. Older psychiatrist. Now is there anything else you wish to say, Dr. Loomis? Loomis shakes his head, picks up his hat, and walks out of the row. I didn't mention he. This is a few years after the first one was filmed, obviously. To look younger, though, Loomis wears a hat, and his uh, goatee has been dyed darker. He pauses at the aisle, scoffs, puts on his hat, then he leaves the room. And we get a quick, well, we get a scene in the hallway. It's just Loomis walking there, hands in his pockets. And then Loomis visits Michael in his cell. A young Michael sits staring out a window. This is a different actor than the same actor who plays young Michael in Halloween 2. Michael sits staring out a window. The camera moves in close to Michael as it cuts back and forth between him and Loomis. Loomis says, you fooled them, haven't you, Michael? But not me. It's a nice delivery for what is basically a throwaway line and a throwaway scene. And Michael does seem to noticeably react. He blinks. Uh, In the novelization, young Michael Myers, when he isn't murdering his sister, is relatively normal. His eyes were warm. His smile genuine, the novel says. And when he spoke, it was with artless sincerity. In fact, more than one newspaper report described him as charming. Also, when forced to tell Judge Christopher about Michael in, quote, plain terms, Loomis admits, quote, he has done nothing to our direct knowledge that would indicate anything else but normality, end quote. Michael's presence makes the other patients restless. Patients who slight Michael 
end up injured later, often with Michael nowhere near them. For example, a 16-year-old girl named Sophie beats Michael in a game of musical chairs, and she is nearly drowned while bobbing for apples at a Halloween party. From your novelization. The next game was ducking for apples. A huge vat had been borrowed from the kitchen, filled with water, and a dozen apples floated in it. The idea was for the children to pick an apple out of the water using just your teeth. After eight or nine children had gone, it was Sophie's turn. Michael stood third or fourth in line behind her. She leaned over the lip of the vat, struggling to keep her hands behind her back to resist the temptation to grab the apple. The lights went out. It is not uncommon for the lights to fail at Smith's Grove, especially on windy nights. The trees fell on power lines in rural areas, but it was not a windy night. Loomis had been prepared for anything but this. He leapt from his chair and ran in the pitch darkness to the spot where he thought the bat was. He bowled over several shrieking children and groped the last few steps until he collided with the platform on which the vat stood. At that moment, the hospital's own emergency generators, which tripped on automatically when the main utility system failed, brought light back into the auditorium. Sophie lay face down beside the vat, drenched from the waist up. Loomis searched the room for Michael. He stood under a basketball backboard at least ten steps away, smiling. Loomis looked at the boy's costume and hands. They were completely dry. The nurse, Loomis supplied artificial respiration, and after a moment, the girl brought up a large quantity of water, sputtering and gasping. The party was over. Loomis's trap had failed. End quote. Loomis allowed the Halloween party, hoping something would happen, and Michael would be caught doing it. Loomis suspects that at any time Michael wanted to leave, he would simply have to ask an orderly for keys, and they would hand them over. But back to the phone proper. Minute eight. We fade into black screen. We hear the rain and thunder, and it's a Smith's Grove, Illinois. Those words fade out, and then October 30th, 1978, and we dissolve to a highway. From the script, two headlights appear in the darkness, backlighting the rain that pours down on a lonely strip of highway. A station wagon hisses along the wet road surface. This car, of course, is a 1976 Ford LTD station wagon that was rented for the film, Carpenter told Tommy Lee Wallace to get the most government-looking car he could. They rented this car, put in the wire mesh divider, put the decals on the doors, and the car rental agency didn't even know they were using it for a movie. We get lightning, and then we're inside the station wagon. This is, of course, filmed inside a garage. Same garage where Tommy Lee Wallace would carve the jack-o'-lantern featured under the main credits. From the script, the back seat is separated from the front by a wire mesh screen, much like a police car. Marion, 30, drives. She is dressed in a crisp white nurse's uniform. She's not in the movie, of course. Next to her in the passenger seat is Sam Loomis, a clinical psychiatrist. He is a tough-looking man in his 40s who flips through pages in a manila folder. Note, of course, Sam Loomis is named for Marion Crane's lover in Psycho. Marion Crane, of course, was played by Janet Lee, Jamie Lee Curtis's mother. The nurse's name is Marion Chambers, named from Janet Lee's character in Psycho, and Chambers from the sheriff in Psycho. In the novelization, this is how Loomis is described. Quote, His head was shaved bald, but he wore a gray goatee, giving him a slightly diabolical appearance. He dressed in a limp, wrinkled brown suit and not very rainproof trench coat, and apparently gave no heed whatever to the conventions of good dress. His crystal blue eyes were awesome in their intensity, and you knew at once that mundane matters like proper attire were beneath the interest of a man with such eyes. Now, the dialogue in this scene in the film is in a different order than in the script. For example... Note, when we first see Marianne Chambers here in this minute, she already has a lit cigarette. She actually lights it later. So it's been edited out of sequence. We'll get to a reason why in a little bit. We start with dialogue. Loomis, you ever done anything like this before? Marion, only minimum security. I see. The driver is a few hundred yards up on the right. We get thunder and the minute ends. The editing does not change the content of the scene very much, but what it does is offer a more sympathetic Dr. Loomis. In the novelization, after the conversation is already going, Nurse Treadwell, as she's named in the novelization, is, quote, slightly disappointed that Loomis hadn't asked her anything about herself. 
He does, of course, later ask the question we hear first in the film edit. I mean, have you ever done anything like this before? But by putting this question first in the film, the edit subtly offers up a Dr. Loomis who cares about other people before he cares about his mission of protecting the world from Michael Myers. The film needs Loomis to be personable. And yet, unlike the novel's version of Loomis, he seems a lonely old man who couldn't possibly have a wife and a teenage son. We see neither of them in the book, but they do exist. It is his wife that he calls from the phone booth by the stop truck. In the novelization and in the script, Loomis is business first here as we come into the conversation, as he is already talking about Michael's appearance before the judge procedures, and Marion asks about what drug they will use on Michael. The film needs Loomis to be personable. We need to like him. Loomis is the Cassandra figure here. One of John Kenneth Muir's pieces of the slasher film paradigm, but also a little obvious in this instance, Muir suggests, quote, Cassandra figures serve as explicit reminders that man proposes and God disposes, or that fate will have its way, end quote. Fate is, as we will see in minutes 16 and 17, an explicit theme in Halloween. Additionally, one of the common themes among slasher films is the absence of or ineffectiveness of adults and authority figures. The Cassandra figure is this incarnate. In the end, Loomis will prove both abruptly useful and then again quite ineffective when he shoots Michael and Michael escapes anyway. In the postmodern slasher film Behind the Mask, The Rise of Leslie Vernon, great movie if you like slasher films and or fake documentaries, the titular killer suggests that all such killers must earn themselves an Ahab. Loomis is not just Cassandra predicting the mayhem to come only to have his prediction fall on deaf ears, but he is the Ahab, obsessed. And except for the briefest of moments here in this film, we don't really see Loomis at work. We see him out there in Halloween, in Halloween 2, Halloween 4, Halloween 5, Halloween 6, hunting his white whale. An interesting bit from the Cliff's Notes on Moby Dick. Quote, to him, Moby Dick is not just some dumb brute. The white whale is a facade, a mask, behind which lurks the inscrutable thing, the force that is Ahab's true enemy. Ahab is certain that the force is evil, or perhaps Ahab is madness itself, striking out against the essential powers of the universe, which he cannot possibly defeat. End quote. Pat Gill in the essay, The Monstrous Years, Teens, Slasher Films, and The Family, suggests, quote, Contemporary horror plays out many of the defining characteristics of the Gothic. Defenseless heroines, suppressed passions, unspeakable desires, fearful landscapes, and haunted uncanny interiors, untrustworthy and suspicious relations and relationships, terrifying uncertainty and stifling knowledge, familial secrets and their dreadful exposure, and jarring juxtapositions of the moral and the monstrous, the sexual and the grotesque, the virtuous and the violent. End quote. Murray Leader offers up an entire chapter in his Halloween Devil's Advocate series book on Michael as cosmic horror. He refers to Loomis as a Cassandra figure, but draws specific comparison between Dr. Loomis in Halloween and Dr. Marinus Bicknell Willett in H.P. Lovecraft's The Case of Charles Dexter Ward. Ward has even escaped from a mental institution in that story, and Willett is Ward's doctor, hunting his own patient. Additionally, Ward is obsessed with an ancestor who he resembles and later resurrects. In the novelization of Halloween, of course, Michael is possessed by an ancestor and acts in echo of that ancestor's prior actions. Leader quotes Linda Williams describing Loomis in an essay, Film Madness, The Uncanny Return of the Repressed in Polanski's The Tempest, as, quote, throwing up his hands in unscientific despair at the unfathomable disturbance of nature represented by the psychotic murderer who haunts the streets of a small town, end quote. Leader himself suggests, quote, Loomis's brand of treatment, in air quotes, has made Michael far worse and has actually reified him into a force of evil by diagnosing him as one. End quote. In the end of the film, minute 88, Loomis will, without the context of Laurie's prior conversations with Tommy, proclaim that Michael is, in fact, the boogeyman. But let us not get too far ahead of ourselves. That is all from minute 8. 
Michael Myers Minute is a production of Lemming Drops Studio. You can find more content at lemmingdrops.com. You can stalk me on Twitter and Facebook at Myers Minute or Instagram, Michael Myers Minute. Or join our Facebook listeners group, 45 Lampkin Lane. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a nice review if you like what you hear. Until next time. See you later. Bye. Bye.